today. Is that good for everyone? Dottie, can you hear me? Maybe not. We uh, continue today to uh, consider the images that God has given to us of what we generally call the church, but for our study we're calling the gathering. And uh, as I was preparing this week, I, I remembered a piece of music that I always in, enjoyed in days gone by. Um, it was Dvorak. You ever listen to that side of the music? Okay. He did something called Pictures at an Exhibition. Are you familiar? It's a, it's a marvelously creative piece in which the whole idea is that each movement of his symphony is tailored to represent a particular picture that one would be looking at if one were in a museum looking at paintings on the wall. To see, you know, if he could invoke the feeling of uh, that picture so that it would draw you in as if you could actually see the picture. Uh, I don't really believe there was an actual picture behind everyone, but I'm not that much of an art historian, so I wouldn't know. I remember one in particular, you, you knew immediately that you were in the barnyard and there were little chickens running around. And, uh, it's just a brilliant piece of, of music. So visually, uh, we, we have uh, representations uh, of things we want to communicate, as we spoke about last week. We can also do it... Uh, through music. The Word of God, which, by the way, always remember, was written primarily uh, with the possible exception of things like Kings and Chronicles, to be an oral production, something that people would hear more often than they would read, because uh, it was written in a time and place where people generally didn't read. So it was written to be read uh, in public places. And you may even remember in the Old Testament at various times when, when the people gathered for renewal and revival, the Word of God was just read straight through. Uh, and they would sit and listen to it. And so when you're, when you're doing uh, that kind of communication, you cannot fall back on italics, underlining bolds, uh, paragraphs, offset, Anything of that kind, parentheses. Um, we're, we've become so addicted to them. My youth group and I, we used to joke about, um, you know, there was air quotes. We've created a whole other system. There was parenthetics, there were italics. <laughs> we had a whole system for that. Uh, because we're so used to, to the visual presentation of communication that without it, it kind of feels funny. Uh, but that was not the case when the Bible was written down, any of it. And uh, therefore, these images of the gathering are given to us to help us visualize spiritually what God's uh, purpose and plan for the, those that he's bringing to himself through Christ by faith is. Uh, and last time that we were together, we saw that the gathering is God's flock, which he tends with his love and his protection, John 10. The gathering is the field in which God is producing fruit through us. 1 Corinthians 3, same verse, 3.10 actually. The gathering is the building which God is constructing by us. And after that thought is introduced, and we're encouraged to be good builders, and the famous portion about whether we're building with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. And you know that, that that's all a metaphor, because never, nobody's ever built uh, strictly with silver and gold, and you know, build a large structure out of that stuff that would just kind of collapse, as valuable as that, that sort of thing, thing is, you know. Uh, even the towers in, that uh, fell in Manhattan were not made of anything like that. Uh, 
see steel and uh, cement, and uh, even they came down. So the gallery is also, we learned, the temple, the emphasis of which is it is the place like the tabernacle in the Old Testament, like the temple in the Old Testament, where God dwells in holiness amongst his people who must also be holy. The instruction that we are to be holy even as he is holy is an Old Testament and a New Testament instruction. And we could have spent some time on that word holy, and we probably will in the future, because I think sometimes people have associations with the word that um, rob it of its heart. You probably don't think of holy as a word with heart, but it has a whole lot of heart. It has God's heart in it. But we'll talk about that another time. So we're going to look at three more images for the gathering today. And they're all found in uh, the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. So if you would join me in Ephesians, that's where we'll be parking today. Ephesians and chapter 1 is our first location. I want to read uh, a longish portion because I'm a big fan of context. So even if we don't do each and every verse, it's necessary always to have a context. And if you haven't heard that word before used in reference to the Bible, let me explain because it is that important. The context is a place where a biblical thought lives. It colors it, it informs it, it explains it. It's the way that you know who God is talking to and why he's saying it. There are many things that you take them out of context, as our news reporters are so good at doing, suddenly say something completely opposite from what they were intended to mean. One of my favorites, because <laughs> these things make the rounds in church. Different church cultures have different ones making the rounds. Uh, you know that little book I read from this morning? In their, in their circles, the circle that that came from, it's uh, common to tell a young man who wants to move on in service to the Lord, maybe get a little pulpit time, uh, you know, move in the direction of, of serving in that fashion. Um, well, you know, the scripture says, a man's gift maketh way for him. Of course, they always KJV people. Maketh way for him. And I took for granted, since these were saintly people, and they were <coughs> quoting the scripture, that there was some weight to that, and that young man needed to learn that if, that if he had any real gift from the Lord, it would be recognized. Although, how it's going to be recognized if they never let him open his mouth, I don't know. <laughs> but that was, that's a discussion for another time, too. The thing was, when I went and looked it up, it's in Proverbs. And in context, what it means is, if you want to get the ear of the king, bring a good bribe. Because <laughs> there are times when Solomon said things that were very pra pragmatic, not necessarily things that he was extolling, but the realities of life is if, you, if you're going to do business with a king, you need an entree. And sometimes that has to be something of value and expense. So a man's gift, what he's willing to give the king, uh, opens the door to the king's presence. I don't think that's what they really wanted to say to the young man. <laughs> that if you bribe us, <laughs> we'll give you some pulpit time. Uh, so I've become very uh, concerned over the years that many things that um, we say lightly and quickly uh, may be half-truths, uh, may be somewhat beneficial, but in context have a richer meaning and sometimes sadly completely an opposite meaning from the way they're tossed around. So that's just an aside to explain why I often read more than just a verse that I'm going to look at, okay? So Paul says in verse 15 of Ephesians 1, page 1159, 
For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might." that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So you see, we could have gone to verse 23 and said, the church is the body of Christ. And we would have been perfectly uh, honest about that. And it would have taught us something. Uh, one gentleman wrote that the body, uh, speaking of this image, is that through which the Lord chooses to express himself to the world. It's a nice thought, but where this thought is introduced, that's not what Paul is saying. Uh, not at all. And you have a whole lead up to that. He wants the saints, the believers in the church at Ephesus, to understand what they have. And I think today, more than any other time, uh, pastors all over America who have uh, a true faith and a heart for God uh, are struggling with this very issue that our people do not realize and do not value what they have in Christ. They certainly don't value it enough to really have a passion to come and worship Him. Worship is optional for many people. It's when it fits into my schedule. If I don't oversleep. If I don't have something that somebody has invited me to do that day. Um... Worship takes precedence. If you have a sense of value, what is yours in Christ? He is the best thing, believers, that we have and always will be. He is the all-beautiful one. He is the precious Lord. He is the one who died to save and rose to conquer death for us. And now he wants fellowship with us. And what could possibly more valuable than that. So, Paul wants them to understand that the body that they are a member of has hope for the future, and they have riches in Christ. Verse 18. Riches. Riches. If you don't know what they are, it's time to open up that Bible and start searching them out. Because they're explained all the way through. Uh, there are things that God is giving us now and things that God is giving us in the future in our heavenly home that nothing else can give. Even simple things like peace. When God gives it, it's a peace that passes understanding. God's peace is, is always different. Everything that God gives us that may have a word similar to something else in our world, uh, God does it better, does it deeper, does it higher, does it wider, does it more beautifully than the world can ever do. And when he does it, it's eternal. It lasts. It doesn't go away. We have riches. We have hope. The body is a place where we enjoy the power of God in us. In our weakness, we often don't sense that. But it's not about having an electrical energy that we plug into. It's having the ability to live through and at times have victory over everything that life brings. Because the same power that raised Christ from the dead, is now working in the gathering. 
And as an individual, you have that power of Christ. But more so, when you come together, you get recharged. That's the way God structured it. It is the gathering that has the power. When he says works in you, remember we said so many of these yous are plural? It's plural. It's working in yous. And you can't have that work in use unless use are together. And then you'll know the power of God. It is about a relationship with the Lord that is immensely intimate. He is the head of the body. We are his body. Over in chapter 5, keep your finger there, but turn over chapter 5, where our theme verse comes from. Just a little further down, in verse 28 and 30, that can't be right. Since it, and, oh, no, it is. Okay. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Now let me quickly say, because I know some of your minds are rapidly going to illustrations of people who really don't like their bodies, right? Uh, and other people who are abusive to themselves and so forth. When Paul says, no one ever, he's talking about people who are well in their mind and in their spirit, okay? He's not talking about the people who are experiencing mental illness or people who are affected by the modern sinful culture. Body image is a big thing. You know there's even a political ad out there right now. One candidate attacking the other because the implication is he brought down the body image of women or he, you know. And I'm not going to say whether he did or didn't. I think <laughs> that's not what we're here for to talk politics. But this is so important in our culture. We talk about this all the time. Uh, we spend money. I saw an ad this week for a little piece of plastic. You're supposed to stand on and go like this. So you get thin. Why does that sell? Because we care about whether we're thin or not. Uh, why are people constantly trying to find a new way to eat? Not just diets now. It's, you know, vegetarian, <coughs> vegan, who knows what all. Because they want to be well. My wife is gluten-free. She didn't go out and seek that. She had to be that to be well. We care for our bodies. We do, unless there's something seriously needs to be dealt with in, in the head. So uh, when the scripture says that we are Christ's body, understand that we are that which he cares about. Not only did he hand himself over for us, not only is he seeking to beautify us for the day of uh, the marriage feast of the Lamb, uh, but day by day, always, he cares about us. Because we are part of him. It's an amazing thought, really, isn't it? We are part of God in that sense that Christ has made us his body. And God has, God has made him to be head over all things to the church. And who is the him in verse 22? It tells us the one under whose feet all things have been placed. So the one who is, is by God's design, ruling and reigning... Even now, we're his body. That's why he says earlier in chapter 1, that he's made us to sit in heavenly places. Why? Because Christ is sitting in heavenly places. And we're in him. This is a nice hall, but it's not a heavenly place. But we are sitting in heavenly places because we are represented there uh, by Christ in whom uh, we have, with whom we have this intimate relationship. So this is, a, this is an important image, and Paul uses it frequently. Uh, consider, but we won't look at it this morning, 1 Corinthians 12, where in order to sort out some of the issues going on in Corinth about what went on in, in their worship times, as particularly to some degree in uh, how tongues would function in that setting, he has to teach them about how every part of the body is of value. And to set up one gift over another is wrong. 
My charming smile may be my best feature. Actually, I have a lousy smile, according to my wife, at least in pictures. <laughs> it could be my best feature. But it's not going to sit there looking good unless the other parts of my body are holding it in place. And that's what Paul tells us in Corinthians 12. The body needs each other. No matter what function you may serve, your function is important. I wasn't here but one week, and Rusty said, I'm the one who makes the coffee. <laughs> and you know what I like most about that, Russ? You said it with proper pride. <laughs> you have a job, and you do it. Uh, and that is a wonderful thing. And everyone in the church should know where they fit in. And if they don't feel like they fit in, talk to the pastor, talk to the elders. We'll find a place for you. Because everybody does have a place. And everybody's place is important. Everybody who had coffee this morning, did you enjoy your coffee? Mm -hmm. It's important. <laughs> well, this was the one day she made it. That kind of undermines my illustration. And that's because Russ was doing another thing. The one thing that didn't get done last week was bringing the tables back up. The tables didn't cooperate, but we got them back up. And thank you for that. Okay, so the body of Christ is one image. Now, over in chapter 2, and this time I'm going to go out of Bible order for this, because... Because um, I want to. Uh, <laughs> there are two of them in chapter 2. Um, and I'm going to get read one more long segment, 11 to the end of the chapter. But I want you to see the context for these images. Because they're of no value unless you understand what Paul was trying to accomplish when he introduced them. So, chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And if you really understand the teaching of Scripture, you know, boy, that's a desperate place that Gentiles were. Amen. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And having reconciled us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility, he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. In verse 19 and 21, we learn that the church, um, I should actually say, yeah, 19 20, is uh, the household of God. Now, because it's important for this passage, and because it will be important later when we talk about the ordinances of the church, I want to introduce to you the concept of household as the New Testament understands it. See, we think of a household as being pretty nearly synonymous with family, right? Um, and in a certain sense, the Greek household was synonymous with family, but it was greater than that, and it was always greater than that. The head of the household had as his household the building, the family, the servants, the pigs, the chickens, the furniture, 
Everything was included in that. The fields out back, whatever he owned that was his property and his place, and I say his because generally in the ancient world, there are not many exceptions to that. In many cultures, women were not even allowed to own property. That's not my fault. Don't attack me about that. But his property uh, was the household. So whenever you read household in scripture, uh, you, you, you must realize that uh, not every person in it is being referenced. You use your intelligence as to what the household means in, guess what, the context. In the context. Uh, and in this context, uh, the household is probably at its most inclusive because it is God's household uh, that we are as the gathering. Uh, we are, uh, one that, that, that is skipped over, by the way, is an identifier for the, for the gatherings. We're fellow citizens. Uh, that means there's a whole city image going on about the church, too. Maybe we'll talk about that another time. But we're fellow citizens. Verse 19, and members of the household of God. Members of the household of God trans one, translates one word that we don't have an English word for. Um, but it means we're, we're part of that household that God has. And anybody at um, being the head of a household does what? He cares for every aspect of his house. <coughs> he makes sure that it gets painted when it needs to be painted. He makes sure that the children are being educated. He makes sure that the family has clothes. And God, no less than any human being, uh, as we are his household, his gathering, he will care for us. And we are part of that place. And we return at the end of this thought of the gathering uh, that, to the idea of uh, the temple that we had earlier. His household is a temple. Why is it a temple? It's not really a reference to the magnificence of the structure. Although I think in God's eyes, the church is beautiful and magnificent. Uh, it's not a reference to that. It's a reference to the fact that the temple is the place where God's holiness resides. So we come back to that again and again, okay? So if we are members of his household, we're saints. Which actually means holy ones. It's a corruption of a Latin word for holy ones. We're saints. Why? Because we are so immaculately sinless and wonderful. No. Because as uh, holiness, excuse me, holiness primarily means um, in all the scriptures, we have been separated from the things of this world to be completely for God. Just as he separates himself from all unrighteousness to be for us. If God ever allowed evil into his person, he would no longer be God, as we understand him. And so it's a place where the, ho the holy ones of God can dwell with the Holy Lord in his place. It's interesting, too, just as a, a subnote, the fluidity of images, because this is the same apostle who in Corinthians tells us that Christ is the foundation, it's the only foundation. And here he's working with a different group for a different image, and he says that the foundation is the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus is the cornerstone, which is an Old Testament image as well. Um, so uh, that's just an example that if you, if you try to handle the scriptures mathematically, you'll get yourself in trouble. Deal with it contextually. Deal where, with it where it lives, <laughs> and you'll be on track. Now, the last one that I want to cover today is really kind of precious. In verse 15, we read that he abolished the law and commandments expressed in ordinance, and he created in himself Who's that? In Christ. In himself, one new man in place of the two. And thus making peace. 
in God's design. In ancient times, he called a man named Abraham to be the first of a nation, but also to be the first of a household of faith. And Israel was to be a shining example of what it was to be the people of the living God, the only true God. Uh, they failed in that miserably at various times. But that was their goal. And because if they had done what they were designed for, uh, no one could have missed it. Part of the design was also that the world may know that there is a true God. And come to him. And there were multiple provisions made for the fact that people would come. Uh, there, there were laws and structures about how to bring in Gentiles and, and, and include them into the Jewish community. Um, it's not one of the emphasis we hear a lot because we're, we're moving along the top of the surface often of Old Testament history, but it's true. And uh, so instead of creating uh, a magnetic force, if you will, in the world that drew the Gentiles to the living God, uh, they became divisive. Uh, and at most times, uh, in ancient times, uh, there weren't many nations that were very friendly about the Jews. They saw them as snotty, uh, as having this this bizarre religion that claimed only one God, what's up with that? And um, simply weird. And uh, nobody liked them. Nobody, by and large. Um, some of them came to like them. Nebuchadnezzar was drawn in. And his, uh, because Daniel was what God intended. Uh, so, there was, this, uh, there was this division, and it was also a division that was, in a sense, part of God's plan. There were those who had been brought near to God through uh, the commandments and the ordinances that God had given them, the Jews, and there were those who didn't have that. And they are called in the Old Testament as not his people and far off. But when Christ came, Part of his mission, you see, again, we always look at his mission as what's in it for us. God had a much bigger plan than that. Part of his mission was to bring these two groups together and bring about peace. And my, how the world needs that kind of peace today. And everybody has a different idea as to how we're going to find it. But the only place where true peace can be found is when men and women of every tribe and nation and tongue come together in Christ. That's the only place you're going to find true and lasting peace. Because once you're there, you are all sons of the living God. You have equal standing. You are firstborn children of His. And you can grow together in Him and know peace. And that's the purpose of this new man. The gathering was created, let us also remember, not just to bring people close to God, but at the expense of Christ who gave himself for her. We were doing this service to ourselves not to keep that in the forefront of our thinking. How much Christ suffered and, and, and how, much, um, how much he did in order that we might have all that we have in him. There is an individual aspect of this which comes to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, and one, of the more, one of the precious verses of the New Testament. Paul in chapter 5 is speaking about the work that the ambassador of Christ has to do. And that's how he styles himself. An ambassador. Um, but in verse 17, describing 
the essence of the message which he's about to call reconciliation. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, takes us back to that body image, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a totally different phenomenon. The old has passed away. Behold, the new, and this says has come, I think, is coming in. It's a better rendering, actually. Um, powerful verse to understand what our salvation is to be. It's not just a matter of saying the right words at the right time and knowing that, therefore, I can go to heaven. That is called cheap grace. That fails to understand the agenda of God altogether. Salvation is that uh, work of God, work of God, by which the sinner is made a saint. And just saying that, you realize a transformation has to be involved. Right? And that transformation is ongoing. The work of the Holy Spirit in us to sanctify us and to make us uh, into the image of Christ. You should actually be able to periodically reflect the end of the month, the end of the year, whatever, and ask yourself the question, what struggles have lessened in me with the things that tempt me in life? What attitudes have improved in me that needed improvement? In what way has my service to Christ enlarged? Because it's about change. It's about transformation. The life of the past is gone. Forget it. And if you're still holding on to that, then the real question you need to ask yourself is, am I really a saint? Am I really, by faith, one of God's own? Now, a lot of people don't want you to, to invite them to question their faith. I'm not asking you to question your faith if you have real faith. I'm asking you to question, do you have real faith? Are you being changed? Is the Holy Spirit at work in you? Because the Holy Spirit is the mark of God's presence in you. You're new. And you need to uh, explore that newness. At the end of that chapter is a verse which doesn't address any of these images and doesn't address uh, what I, uh, this, this newness matter, but I can't be this close to it and not read it to you. Because if you think on this verse in terms of the transformation that God desires to bring to your life, it will be power, it will be refreshment, it will be guidance to you for the process. Verse 21, for our sake, for our sake, he made him, who? Jesus. To be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's amazing, isn't it? It's what we call amazing grace. That he allowed Christ to bear our sin so that we could be sinless before God. If we believe that, and if we appreciate that, we will not be comfortable allowing sin to rule in our lives. We will struggle. We all struggle. You could probably take out paper right now and write down your ten top struggles. You know them. 
but you won't be comfortable with them, you will not accept them, you will desire to see them changed and laid before the feet of Jesus, placed under his blood and removed from your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gathering. We thank you for Christ who gave himself for her. And we thank you, Father, for these images that you have given us to understand what that's all about. The body, the household, and the new man. Father, help us to ponder these things and come to a greater appreciation of all that we have in you and all that we need to become in you. That you may be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.